Welcome to Crying Out Cloud, the podcast that will make you laugh, cry, and reconsider all of your cloud security fears. I'm Eden from the CTO team at Waze, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Amitai. We are super grateful and excited for this opportunity to help you dive into the deluge of cloud security news and teach you its importance. So are you ready, Amitai? I'm ready. Cool. What's happening in the cloud? What are we going to cover this week? Today, we're going to be talking about PerfCTL malware campaign. We're going to be talking about uh, Storm 0501 hybrid cloud attacks. And we're going to be talking a bit about behind the scenes of LLM jacking. Rad. Let's do it. So the first one is the PerfCTL malware campaign. Aqua researchers found um, this Linux malware that's been active actually for years and primarily used for crypto mining and proxy jacking. What's super interesting before we go a little more into detail about this is it's kind of been like here and there mentioned on forums, but this is the first time anyone really did uh, full scale research on it. So here we are. Amitai, can you give everyone the TLDR of how PerfCTL works? So PerfCTL is Linux malware. Um, apparently, uh, the way the attackers are gaining initial access to Linux machines is by exploiting vulnerabilities uh, in things like RocketMQ um, and a bunch of misconfigurations. Um, Aqua found that uh, there were uh, something like 20,000 different file paths that the infection servers were were attempting to access, um, basically just trying whatever they could um, in order to gain access to the machine. Um, and then from there, what it does is it does a bunch of different privilege escalation techniques and persistent techniques um, to maintain access to the infected machine. Sometimes it does proxy jacking, uh, which we've spoken about before uh, on this podcast. Um, and sometimes it does crypto jacking. Um, and uh, other than that, it's just a generally very well-built malware that's been going on for a few years now. Um, and like you mentioned, like there have been a bunch of mentions on internet forums and stuff of people sort of running into this thing and, um, and but this is like the first time that that people are sort of saying okay that all of these things are related and this is actually one single campaign apparently that's been going on for years totally another element of how it works which i just think is super fascinating so worth mentioning and how well they executed it is the malware actually adapts itself to human behavior so uh it makes it quite tough to do a forensic analysis because it hides its origin and operations and like deletes the original binary after it's executed. Um, so that puts people in a pickle to figure out where it's coming from. Yeah, and they mentioned that um, the malware sort of goes into stealth mode whenever someone is actually using the machine. Like if someone logs in through SSH, then the malware will sort of like just go silent and stop doing whatever it's doing. Um, if you're listening to this, what should be your takeaways of this malware campaign? So first of all, I mean, there are a few vulnerabilities that it exploits in, in RocketMQ, for example, like I mentioned that people should be patching. Um, other than that, just general uh, misconfiguration detection should be uh, very helpful here as well. Um, I think other than that, you know, for monitoring crypto jacking, it's helpful to have um, security software that checks for like high CPU usage, things like that. Um, like all the generic things that you can do to defend yourself against crypto, crypto jacking would have been pretty effective uh, in this case. And also you can check for um, the hashes that were published in their report um, just to find the specific instances uh, of those malwares. Um, and you definitely should because, as we mentioned, this is incredibly prevalent and um, there's a high chance that at least one machine in your network you know, might be infected with this. Amazing. Uh, for our second story, we have the Storm 0501 hybrid cloud attacks. Uh, Microsoft published a report on Storm 0501, uh, which is a financially motivated threat actor uh, who notably moved from on-prem to the cloud to uh, to run a ransomware deployment. Uh, and it's notable that they targeted a bunch of U.S. organizations like government and law enforcement. Uh, yeah, how did they do this? How did the campaign get run? So apparently uh, they gained initial access by using stolen creds uh, through in info stealers, oh, which is stolen uh, creds. Yeah, it, it's amazing. It's like it's, I think it's like 70, 80 percent of attacks these days are facilitated through stolen creds. Um, 
it's kind of horrible. And uh, I think, as we mentioned on the last episode, some companies are doing are doing things to uh, to improve the um, the situation by making it tougher for threat actors to use stolen creds um, by tying them to a specific machine, for example. Um, in this case, I guess either those didn't work or they weren't available uh, to the targeted uh, uh, victims. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, they 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 moved from on prem to to cloud. And in this specific case, what what I found interesting was that it doesn't look like they were interested in the cloud for the data it contained. Um, they were mainly interested in the identity aspect and the fact that having access to the victims' enter ID tenants sort of served as a backdoor for future access to uh, the on-prem environment. Um, okay, so once they gained access to the on-prem, how did they make the jump into the cloud? So what they did was they navigated within the on-prem environment to um, enter connect sync servers, which are servers that sort of serve to um, ensure syncing between credentials for uh, the cloud environment and the on-prem environment, uh, which means that they are very powerful if you gain access to them as an attacker because they allow you uh, to gain access to the cloud. Um, and other than that, in some cases, they just gained access to um, admins, uh, work machines, and then they stole passwords for the cloud from there. They also leveraged a handful of vulnerabilities. Correct. Were these vulnerabilities um, exploited? And what are they? So beyond using uh, credentials from info stealers, they also exploited vulnerabilities in Zoho Manage Engine, Citrix Net Net Netscaler, um, and Cold Fusion. Which, if you want to read more about, are they on our Threatscape? Yeah, so um, uh, both this and the Perf CTL and the LLM jacking that we'll be talking about in a second are all on the Wiz Threatscape um, with links to uh, the relevant blog posts. You should bookmark the Threatscape. It's a really cool website visually, but also tons of relevant good content. Is there any specific vectors in the on-prem environment you think they were aiming towards? Or it's like there's no indication that Microsoft kind of alluded to? I think they did mention that they were sort of going after um, uh, servers that were likely to contain uh, passwords and credentials and, you know, domain control and stuff like that, because their ultimate goal here was, was to deploy ransomware. Um, in some cases, they didn't. In some cases, they just kind of maintained access for a long time. Maybe their plan was to eventually uh, do a ransomware attack. Maybe their plan was to sell off the access to, to another actor. So it sounds like they had really good intentions. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. They, they, you know, the only reason they attack schools is because, you know, they want to they, they wanna, they wanna improve these schools' IT accounts and stuff. Yeah, generally, you know, I, I think we, we spoke about this uh, before, before the episode, but... Uh, um, ransomware operators used to go off after like individuals, um, and they'd infect their machine. And then like one in every, I don't know, a hundred or thousand cases, they get paid. Um, and everybody else would just ignore them or, or, you know, cry a bit and restore from backups or just cry a bit and never restore from backups, but <laughs> refuse to pay. And then they realized that, you know, it makes a lot more sense financially for them to go after gigantic targets, like, you know government, um, like local government, hospitals, um, companies that can actually pay and, and actually have cyber insurance to cover these things. Um, and that's horrible because, you know, if you go after, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, um, City Hall, that's bad. Um, it's definitely unethical. But if you go after like a hospital, you can actually kill people. Like you can cause, you can cause things to... To, to be delayed, you can you can turn off systems that are necessary to keep people alive. You can cause confusion that's going to lead to doctors making mistakes. Um, and if you target school districts, then you know people can't teach and people can't learn. Um, and uh, you know th these are the kind of actors that that uh, governments should definitely be going after because they're doing a lot more damage um, than than most cyber criminals and possibly even more damage than than nation states. So. The takeaway from this is you need to block info stealers. How are some effective ways to block um, Storm 0501 and their corollaries? So preventing info stealers from infecting your employees in the first place is a really hard problem because uh, people are going to fall for phishing attempts and 
you know, they're going to get their, their laptops infected. That's just going to happen. Um, but what you can do is you can enforce MFA to make sure that the credentials they steal are useless outside of uh, the specific device they, that, that they've infected. Um, you can make sure that credentials are very short-lived. You can make sure that they're tied to the specific machine. Um, you can use SSO to, to make it a bit more difficult to use those credentials. Yeah. Okay. For our third story, we have a dive into behind the scenes of LLM jacking. So this is something we've spoken about before. So if you are a follower of the pod, um, this is a reference you'll know, but we talk a lot about LLM jacking um, in reference to this being a new way for threat actors to monetize access to cloud environments. Um, there was, and still is, a lot of instances of crypto jacking and then proxy jacking. And now this is kind of the new kid on the block. I mean, Ty, I know that Permiso Sistig and Brian Krebs all spoke about this and published um, different reports. Can you kind of dive into a little bit more detail on what they're saying and what else is important for our listeners to know about LLM jacking? So LLM jacking, um, as you mentioned, is the latest way that threat actors are monetizing access to cloud environments and using stolen creds. Um, it essentially boils down to checking if the account that they've compromised has access to uh, LLM services like Bedrock and SageMaker, stuff like that, and then uh, trying to either spin up models that they can use or hijack existing models that have already been deployed, and then just invoking them, um, prompting them with whatever uh, they want to prompt. So you're basically uh, abusing the target's uh, wallet um, in order to uh, use LLMs for free. One of the reasons people do this, and I'm not selling this as a sales point for doing this, but is because it allows them to bypass a lot of bands that are inherently associated with an LLM, uh, protective measures, if you will. Um, how are people abusing this? So basically, if you're going to use like uh, ChatGPT um, and you try to use it for malicious purposes, you might get banned. Um, and in this case, since you are not actually um, the user and you don't own the user and you don't really care if the user gets banned because you can just target another uh, cloud environment and, and continue from there. Um, in this case, they are using a bunch of jailbreaking uh, methods in order to uh, cause the, uh, the LLM to do things that the vendor didn't really intend for it to do. And then they're using it for a bunch of really uh, shady purposes. Um, and uh, in this case, it seems like a lot of them are sort of considered uh, not safe for work, not safe for life, like ethically gray bordering on uh, very black. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that's super interesting, and there's actually a blog post about this if you want to read more about it, but one of the ways to effectively make sure someone doesn't do this to you is to enable logging because for example, what we saw was that if you enabled logging on Bedrock, they didn't come target you. Like, they just stayed clear. They were like, why don't I just go up to someone who doesn't have logging enabled? So that's a big pro. So that was interesting in terms of their methodology. Uh, when Permiso was looking into this, uh, what they realized was um, they could figure out what services these LLMs were being plugged into mm -hmm. uh, based on the prompt logs. So they sort of checked and, and saw that the the prompts seem to be related to certain um, AI characters that are uh, used in certain um, AI uh, character websites. And what was interesting was that in some cases they saw that if they enabled logging, which is what allowed them to figure out the connection here and figure out what that the attacker was doing things they're not supposed to be doing, um, and that there even is an attacker here in the first place, in some cases, the threat actor would notice that logging was enabled and just back off. Um, I'm sure not all threat actors uh, care that logging is enabled. Um, but it's kind of like having who... an alarm on your house. Like, I could yeah. probably go for the house without the alarm. Doesn't mean no one's going to break into your house with an alarm. But, like, we do what we can. Exactly. How did Amazon identify this behavior in their systems and then block the activity? And hat tip to Amazon for doing that. So I'm going to answer like an LLM. Certainly, 
Um, <laughs> here are the things that Amazon did in order to block this. Um, <laughs> so what, I think, as a lot of people know, Amazon sort of scours the internet and like GitHub repositories and stuff for leaked cloud creds. And then what they do is they don't um, block them entirely. They sort of place them into like a quarantine mode automatically. I'm going to call it credentials jail. Credentials jail. That's a good one. Yeah, you go into credential jail. So in this case, uh, apparently what they recently changed was that possibly following this research, possibly following their own internal research and internal monitoring, um, they modified the quarantine policy to actually prevent uh, leaked creds from accessing bedrock. Mm. Uh, so prior to this, um, it was the, the quarantine was mainly focused on uh, blocking crypto jacking. Um, and now it's effective for blocking uh, LLM jacking as well. So this is super interesting as this continues to unfold. And I'm sure we're going to see it have a whole plethora of other behaviors. But huge kudos to Permiso and Sistig and Krebs for um, helping trailblaze this research. Uh, so we can all be in the loop about what's happening and aware to make sure it doesn't affect us. Amitai, what are our potaways take a pods for these three stories? So for uh, Perf CTL, um, scan for the IOCs, uh, make sure that you are uh, patching RocketMQ instances and make sure that you are scanning for application misconfigurations on publicly exposed machines um, and monitor for crypto jacking related activity like um, high CPU usage on your Linux servers. For Stomo 501, um, generic best practices always apply here. Uh, to prevent info stealers from being effective against your your company, um, use MFA, use SSO. Okay, and then takeaways for LLM jacking. Uh, so in this case, um, by quarantining uh, credentials and uh, blocking them from accessing Bedrock, in theory, this should have a really um, a big impact on the the effectiveness for attackers of using these stolen creds in the first place. Um, but Amazon can't find every single stolen cred. Like they can only find those that are um, uh, published online. You're still gonna have a lot of uh, cloud creds that are gonna be stolen through info stealers, just like in the, in, in the previous example. Um, so in that case, you should monitor for access to bedrock, um, especially from like unknown IPs or from VPNs that you're not familiar with. Uh, you should monitor your bills uh, for, for anything related to, uh, to AI. It's always effective to use uh, billing to understand what is normally being used in your cloud environment and then look for anomalies related to billing in order to understand if anything has changed. Um, and you should definitely pay attention to, to big changes uh, to your billing um, and hopefully avoid uh, the bill before it becomes too large. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, wonderful. Thank you, Amitai. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe and share a link to the podcast but not to your cloud keys. Although if you do share a link to your cloud keys, they will now be uh, properly quarantined to prevent LLM jacking against Bedrock. Yeah, but if you share a link to the podcast, there's just no repercussions, just good karma. Exactly. Uh, as always, if your cloud security strategy is making you cry, don't worry, just cry out cloud. Security.